Hi everyone, I'm Heather McLean, editor at SVG Europe, and welcome to the first SVG Europe Women virtual wellbeing event of 2021. It's great to have you here again, even though I can't see you, I can feel the vibes. Um, today, we are work focusing on wellbeing with our special guest speaker, Sarah Hoskin, who is a chartered and counselling psychologist. She's going to take us through a session called Liberation, a Freedom Model for Good Stress. Sarah is going to help us explore the mindset plus signposting tools and techniques for managing the transition between good and bad stress. I know, who knew there was good stress? I don't know. Um, this will help us, innate, help us move into 2021 on a stronger mental health footing. Now, during Sarah's uh, presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A facility to post your questions for her because we could have a good half an hour chat with Sarah. You, she can answer all of your questions. So um, make sure you post lots during her talk. Okay, and without further ado, hello, Sarah. Hello, Heather. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me along. Um, is it okay if I just set up my screen just briefly and yeah. check with you that we are sharing okay? So not a problem. Not a moment. And then um, the magic share screen. Magic share screen. I'm almost there. There we go. That's perfect. And how is that, Heather? Perfect, perfect. I'll leave you to it now, Sarah. I'll be listening. I'm here <laughs> if you need me. Thanks, Heather. Okay, so thank you for inviting me along here today. Um, today's SVG Europe Wellness webinar is about looking at your mindsets towards stress. Um, by the end of the webinar, you will have learned about some tools that you can use to lean in and shape your mindset towards stress differently. I want to explain how by taking responsibility for your mindset, perhaps in a different way, um, by liberating your mindset, you can move more freely towards living a life with greater meaning and joy. So my talk will be in three parts. Um, you can see here, first of all, I'll talk about what is a mindset and look briefly at the relationship between the mind, the brain and the body. Then in the second part, I'll go on to talk about some very exciting research that shows you how by changing your mindset towards stress, you can literally save a life. And you can see the little ring up there. Finally, I'll go on to talk about some tools that you can apply right now to work differently with your mindset. After my talk, as Heather said, there will be time for discussion and questions. So just make a note of any questions you have or ping them on the chat bar. Um, there are some handouts that Heather has that I'm happy to share with you. Here we are, the tools for regulating stress that you are very welcome to have. Um, so moving on. First slide is mindsets. Where is the mind? And I think it's really important to kind of get the distinction between mindsets, the mind, the brain, and the body. We have a brain, body, mind, and mindsets to briefly unpack. So first of all, let's talk about the brain. The brain here, this is the model I use with my clients. Um, just gives you a sense of the brain. The brain is an organ that sits in the body. It's a vast information processing system. Some estimates say that we're born with as many neurons, which are the kind of uh, the brain cells, as there are stars in the Milky Way, a staggering 100 billion. Then add to that the trillions of synapses that form as we go through our lives, as we kind of make meaning and learn new things. And you can be sure of just one thing, and this is important for later on, that you can never presume to know exactly what is happening in someone else's brain. On with the brain. According to Demir Del Monte, a brain expert, the good news about the brain is that every morning we wake up with a brand new brain. The brain loves to love, it loves to live, it loves to learn. The brain is always helping our mind and our body to regulate our system. It's always kind of striving for homeostasis, for balance. Um, every day, a healthy brain forms new memories. So come tomorrow morning, you'll have a memory of this webinar. Um, and it is the same brain that helps the mind to form mindsets. I'm just gonna move my boxes because they're, yeah. 
So let's move on to the mind. Where is the mind? Is it just in the brain? Is it in the brain and the body? Or does it exist in other realms of consciousness? Nobody knows for sure, and there's loads of debate still out there. But what research shows us is that it is our minds that help shape our thoughts, our feelings, our behavior, and our physical health through mindset. So if you kind of imagine your mindset is like a pair of glasses through which you view the world. Um, and like having different kinds of glasses, like I've got my Christmas glasses I wear at Christmas normally with all kind of sparkly things on, or you have dark glasses in the sun. Our mindsets can be different depending upon a whole host of factors. It may be the basic scaffolding of good mental and physical health, which are inextricably linked, just like mind and body. So your mindset, your glasses, your perceptions, your conscious mind could be influenced by what you have or haven't eaten. Um, if you're hungry or hangry, how much sleep you have or you haven't had, or if you're, so if you're tired, or other factors such as your genetic makeup, kind of what's already in the pot, your physical health, you may have um, your childhood, your life experiences, all this stuff feeds in. Um, your relationships, your workload, and of course, luck. So now we're coming out to mapping out meaning. And the point I'd like to make is that it is you who is the designer of your mindset, knowing that there are things like fingerprints that we cannot change, but there are many things that we can. So by accepting your role as you being the designer of your mindset with its limits and its liberation, my next point is that you are responsible for your well-being to a greater or lesser extent. Okay, so I've explained how the mind and mindsets work in designing how we view stress and the world. So let's move on to how this relates to taking responsibility, you taking responsibility for your well-being. And here we have a brain and a little heart, because this is about being compassionate and kind towards yourself, not being perfect, being human, a learner mind making mistakes. It's all in the frame. So now I want to describe why it's important for you to take responsibility for your well-being and to explain the natural process that happens to account for why we all might want to avoid doing this at certain times and to avoid the uncomfortable feelings that can come along with stress. So sometimes when you feel stressed and overwhelmed by events, you can chuck uncomfortable feelings to the back of your mind, into your subconscious, so that you no longer feel upset. This is a normal, adaptive and handy part of the mind's job so that you can get on with life. So if you had all this stuff kind of in the forefront, you wouldn't be able to think, you wouldn't be able to function. So we just shove it back. So I'd like you to consider how this stress mindset or this habit of pushing certain uncomfortable, stressful feelings and thoughts away into the subconscious can be built up over a lifetime. Now, while this stress or the stuff, information you haven't processed and filed away at night when we sleep, when we dream in REM sleep, and the eyes are moving to and fro, it's hypothesized that that's when all the filing happens. Um, so the stress may be resolved over time. You may watch a telly program, have a chat with a friend, and it's just like, oh, that's why, so the system can file. Some stuff doesn't get filed, and it can get triggered and come out in different ways at different times. So if you imagine that you have a pot that fills up with stressors, and we shove it in there, we shove it in there, or Pandora's box, we push it in the box, one foot on the lid, if you could see my feet, you'd see a foot on the lid going, yes, I'm fine, la, la, la. And it kind of builds up, builds up. Often this stuff can be out of awareness. 
or it may be in awareness. Um, and then, so you have your pots filling up with all the emotional stuff. Emotions are what you feel in the body. It's your kind of physical. We get churned up, adrenaline and cortisol, stress hormones, and we, we push them at, down so that we can get on, use our access, our rational brain, get on with the day. But one drop on top of what's already in there can set you off. So for example, um, they research found that people who had experienced 9-11, whether they had post-traumatic stress or not, depended on what was in their brain the day before. So kind of how full their, their pot was already, if that makes sense. Um, so what might come out is emotions that feel out of perspective to the event, to the here and now. So it could be excessive anger, excessive sadness, excessive anxiety, kind of erratic behavior, or thoughts that can be distressing for you and for those who work or live with you. So your system gets dysregulated. And this is absolutely not a call for everyone to seek therapy. But without shadow of a doubt from my lived in experience as a person and as a psychologist specializing in, uh, specializing in counseling, Therapy can help you immensely. How can it help you? It can provide a safe, non-judgmental space for you to make sense of things in different ways, to process information differently, to make more space in your pot, or to make the container bigger so that you have a greater capacity or resilience in your life. It's a call for taking responsibility for your well-being, but with kindness and compassion and not going, oh my goodness, I have to be perfect, I have to be the perfect me. For growing kindness and compassion towards yourself and others, as workers, friends, partners, as fellow human beings, you can make a difference. So I'd now like to, having done the bit about the brain, the body, the mind, about mindset, I'd now like to change direction and move on to the next part of the webinar, which is to look at some research, very exciting research, that directly links your stress mindset to your lifespan. So if there's one takeaway, it's this one. Okay. So knowing about stress can save lives, the research. How can your stress mindset save a life? Kelly McGonigal, who's a health psychologist, author, lecturer at Stanford University, presents some research in a TED talk that you can find online to show how our mindset towards stress shapes how long we live. There's a host of research out there that links stressors such as chronic work stress, adverse life events, so that's your kind of bereavement stuff, your trauma, the kind of big ones, but also when you have lots of little events, we call them little T, you have your big T traumas, your road traffic accidents, your bereavements, but you also have your little T traumas that will kind of build up over time and fill up your pot. There's, there's, so there's a link between these stressors to death from illness, from disease such as cardiovascular disease. In this study, Keller and colleagues looked at 30,000 adults over an eight year period in the US and they looked at the death records. And they found that, I'm just gonna see if my clicking works here. Here we go. That individuals who A, perceived that stress is bad for them, so this is your mindset and affects their health, and B, reported a large amount of stress in their lives, Okay. had a 43% increased risk of premature death. So that is staggering. The good news is that by contrast, those who saw stress as a normal part of their life, as healthy, as a response to something external that's happening, Despite experiencing similarly large number of stressors, so they had all the big, all the big T traumas, all the little T traumas kind of adding up, 
had the lowest risk of dying from stress-related illness. Why is that mindset? A different mindset. So here we can see how two people giving a presentation respond differently to stress. One person here, the good stress mindset, has a mindset that per perceives stress as a good thing. It's normal, it's healthy. The other person, the bad stress, um, has a mindset that perceives stress as a bad thing. And as you can see, their physical reactions to stress are exactly the same, except for one major difference. So the heart's pounding, so you're releasing your adrenaline and your cortisol, which are the stress hormones that come out, make your breath might be going faster. Thoughts are racing because you're looking for the predator. Like, oh, what's happening? The person experiencing a good stress mindset is releasing a neuro hormone that you may well have heard of called oxytocin, the love hormone, the cuddle hormone. And we shall see why that is a good thing coming up. And there is a little clue in, in my smiley heart face there. Okay. Oxytocin. So there we are. We have two people, one who has a mindset that stress is good for your health and the other that has the mindset that stress is bad for your health and they have a point. Oxytocin is released under stress. But unlike adrenaline and cortisol, which constrict the blood vessels leading to the heart, and you can see the sad smiley face constricted, oxytocin opens the blood vessels and actually heals the heart from stress-related reactions. It is anti-inflammatory and it strengthens your immune system. And also the wonderful thing about oxytocin, not only that, but it also makes you want to connect with others and form bonds with others. It kind of comes from where's my brain? Here we are, the little mammalian brain. So, so originally our reptilian brain stemmed down here when we were in the swamp. Then we came out and we had the mammalian brains, which are little mice in pets at home. And they want to befriend and tend and kind of snuggle up. So that part of our brain there wants to form bonds with others. Hence the title, the love or cuddle hormone. And that in, in turn, not only do we want to kind of cuddle up to others, but it raises our empathy because we want to tend for them. So, so that's, that's the research. It's really, really exciting. Um, in the final part of this webinar, I will present some tools to show you how you can change your mindset. Just remember that you are the expert on you. And out there on the internet, there's tons of conflicting information, the latest guru on how to shape your thoughts, your feelings, your habits, your physique, everything. Um, so then it becomes a case of just finding out what works for you. Um, just because the research says that I don't know, eight out of 10 basils prefer, which is Heather's dog, prefer crunchy peanut butter. You might be one of the two that prefers it smooth. Or you might be a person with a totally different preference who they didn't ask in the research. So find the tools for change that work best for you. That is really important. Okay, so moving on to the tools now, managing mindsets. Um, there's, um, I've drawn up a model that I've called AIM. Um, and you can use anything, but it's just kind of being, it's having the, it, being aware of where your mind is communicating better with your mind, love and, love and um, compassion and empathy towards self. So this one here, uh, start off with awareness. The first step is to become aware that you are in a bad stress mindset or whatever you wanna call it, it's just labels. Grow a compassionate and kind mindset towards yourself. When we are under stress, and hopefully you can see this, my brain, um, PET scans show how brains are physically different. So this is the kind of thinking language logic part of the brain, the rational brain. Um, PET scans show how information stops flowing when we're under stress, which is very, very exciting. So we go into fight, flight or freeze modes. So we kind of sink into the mammalian brain or, or the reptilian kind of freeze 
which in humans is depression. Um, fight and flight, think of the little mice kind of running around um, and that's your anger and anxiety in humans. So kind of when, when we're under stress, physically our brain shuts down. So be aware of that. So regulating stress is about getting this part of the brain back, on, back online again. Um, when we do go into fight, flight, freeze modes, we do all or nothing thinking. We may jump to conclusions quickly without considering all of the facts, which is a natural adaptive function. Because if, if you've got kind of got a predator coming towards them, you, you might be a little bit paranoid, but you have to think, are they going to attack me? So it has a huge, huge um, survival value. You may become angry, scared or sad more quickly. And again, thinking back to your stress mindset. Um, by being aware, you can learn to regulate your thoughts and emotions better and kind of invite the brain information to reconnect and flow more smoothly. Insight. Once you are aware of your mindset, you can then investigate what triggers you and what regulates you. Um, uh, we all have from the cradle to the grave, rupture and repair throughout the life cycle. Um, so, you know, so like your little baby, ah, and kind of cuddling it and that's the repair well we need to do that to ourselves be so be aware um i'm, I'm going to run through a couple of exercises that clients use to do just this called the wheel of awareness and the window of tolerance great for children as well um so managing managing your mindset goes hand in hand with awareness and insight so i will go through a brief example of steps to take in the workplace some steps and some ways in which the workplace might support your well-being in addition to this exciting project. Okay. Wheel of awareness. First tool is the wheel of awareness or the wheel of life. And Heather has this in my um, in the handout that I've given her. Uh, it comes from life coaching and it's widely used in the workplace and in therapy. What's really good about it, what I love, I don't know how much detail you can see. Um, it gives a quick snapshot of where you are right now to grow awareness, insight and to manage change. And you can shape it to match what you want to measure, be it life, stress, relationships, work satisfaction, whatever. So you can see, hopefully you can see around the edge, the titles that are there for this one. So it could be you're measuring your health, um, job satisfaction, um, uh, leisure time, it could be anything. So you write your own headings around the wheel and then rate from naught to 10 from the inside out to how satisfied you feel in each area. And you put the crosses in and then you join them up. And there we are, it's a little springboard. It shows you kind of, you get it a star shape as to kind of what might be in or out of your, uh, out of kilter in your life right now so that you can choose what you need to do more of or might, what you might want to do less of. Okay, next tool, window of tolerance. We all have a window of tolerance, which, which kind of represents your capacity for stress at any given moment. When you're feeling um, regulated, thinking rationally connected, you, you kind of imagine yourself in the frame somewhere. Find that we might kind of, there's a little heart, you might bump up to the edge of the frame as you get more, stress sometimes you may pop outside of the frame and become dysregulated you might come outside of your window of tolerance and in that place you may not be thinking rationally you may struggle to have insight into and manage your emotions so so the window of tolerance exercise is to kind of build up some resources and also then outside of the window be aware of what triggers you so this is what uh, an exercise that i do with clients you can list or draw what um what triggers you and so here you can see that's resources so inside the window of tolerance we're pinging down some resources that regu might regulate so could be family and friends dogs swimming all kinds of stuff whatever suits you so you tailor make it to match your requirements and then on the outside we write down a list of what triggers us what kind of takes us right to the edge and sometimes we stay out there dysregulated so triggers might be deadlines relationships you've got a whole load of stuff and triggers can also be resources so then 
you look at each one and you, you, you can use the resources from inside to regulate you when you're triggered. Um, it's often good to do this exercise when you're not kind of churned up because then you'll have a clearer mind. Um, so moving on, that's, a, that's, another, that's another exercise that you can use, uh, use it with family as well, really, really helpful. And then just one random tool from many, many tools out there, which, which clients like. I like it because you can do it without props or with props. So my final tool, tool is a quick grounding exercise to use when you feel stressed that you can do wherever you are. And that's the four elements, earth, air, fire and water. So earth grounds you, just notice your feet on the floor or your bum on the seat. You could hold or touch an object, um, just be mindful about that if you wish, that makes you feel calm. Some jewelry, a stone, a cup of tea, whatever it is. Um, the next element is air, the breath. Be aware of the breath and breathe to calm yourself. Again, tons of breathing techniques out there. There's, there's lots of stuff and I've got some in, in my um, strategy tool list. Uh, third one is fire, the imagination. You can imagine that you're in, the, in a calm uh, place that's calming. And the brain doesn't know too well the difference between real and imaginary um, to a degree. So when you imagine that you're in a calm place, like by the beach for me, that calms the brain down. Um, you may have pictures around your phone, around your desk, just on the walls, just so that you kind of look at it and then you that calms you down. You feel the oxytocin flowing through you or close your eyes briefly, visualize the place of calm. Then the final element is water. Often when we get stressed, our mouths go dry. So water is to moisten your mouth. You can use saliva or a glass of water. So these three exercises represent just some of the many, many that are out there to regulate your emotions. As long as you get why you're doing it so that this part of the brain reconnects, then you can find your own, what works for you. Um, and that's, that's really important. Knowing that when you are outside of your window of tolerance, parts of your brain are shut down. You are not thinking clearly as you go into fight, flight and freeze modes. So by being aware, having your insight, managing your well-being, you can regulate your brain and your body to work better for you. So I'd like to end this third part about tools by just quickly running through a workplace example and how you might work with your mindset towards stress to gain a better outcome. So what might a good stress mindset look like? Business is gov governed by deadlines. You feel overwhelmed, you panic and off you go. So it's part of the brain PET scans would be showing that it's kind of information is jumping around, not, not flowing smoothly. Awareness, be aware that you're out of the window of tolerance. Tell yourself it is just a part of you that's feeling the overwhelm. It, it feels like the whole of you, but it is just a part of you. Set of beliefs, set of action, behavior, but it isn't all of you. Be compassionate. In the moment, your mind is not fully rational. You may be catastrophizing, I can't cope, I'm going mad, I'm gonna lose my job, whatever it is. And here I'm jumping to manage because you might not have that insight to kind of work out what you need at that point. Manage your resources to regulate your emotions. Move to get rid of the adrenaline and the cortisol because they, they make your muscles go hard, ready for fight or flight. Um, muscle movement releases myosin, a protein, the hope protein it's called and it drags in the happy endorphins um, so step away from the deck grab a glass of water chuck a stress ball play table tennis bat and ball against the wall punch a cushion have a cry a dance a scream a cup of tea dr ranjan chatterjee who does brilliant uh, podcasts um, he he talks about creating new habits and chaining them to old ones so he says keep a dumbbell by the kettle so 10 reps every cup of tea that's 200 a week if you have three a day. Um, have a squeezy exercise band on the mind. Do, do, do. By the desk, call a friend, do some mindfulness, discharge the energy. You will not be thinking properly, you make mistakes, and you are not productive in this place. Insight. Sit down at a time when you feel ready. Get creative and list out or draw out the triggers and resources. And you may want to do this with work colleagues as well. 
kind of collaborate, be compassionate. Um, uh, it, yeah, sorry, <laughs> where am I? <laughs> if it's too much work, do an Excel spreadsheet, basic kind of housekeeping of your tasks, prioritize them. This is most important. This is the most, again, with collaboration, connect with others. Although we are on our own um, and 30% of people apparently live on their own, reach out and, and kind of engage the oxytocin. Write out a list of your tasks, assign what percentage of your time you spend on each task. And if it's like 200% of your day, then seek help to reprioritize. Do your 360 degrees, manage up the line, down, across, wherever, but, but sort it out. So finally, a few words on what you can do in the workplace to raise awareness of well-being and mental health. Start conversations that reduce the stigma and shame around mental health and raise mental health awareness. You can add the green ribbon to your emails for mental health awareness, the Mental Health Foundation, or the purple and teal ribbon to the bottom and you can put a hyperlink in of your emails for suicide awareness to show that you are open to conversations around well-being issues and that you may know someone who who has suffered in 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 these ways um, if someone comes to you just listen do not judge do not give unsolicited advice with four quadrillion synaptic connections what how would you know what's going on in their brain or what's best for them you can get any advice on any street corner just listen just be present do not be embarrassed to ask how somebody is. If you've noticed they've been a bit kind of preoccupied, check it out. You have nothing to lose but a little pride and a lot to gain. Set up buddy schemes or community interest groups to put mental health in the foreground as a diversity issue. Signpost them to therapy if they feel they need a confidential space to process. Okay. To conclude, each of our mind, mindsets, brains and bodies are unique and there are loads of tools that are fantastic out there to work at regulating your mood and mindset. Um, I've explained how mindsets work, some research and some tools that you can hopefully use to change your mindset, small set. I'd like to end by emphasizing that you are the designer of your mindset and to remember that a good stress mindset can save a life. Thank you, Heather. Oh, there we are, mute. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for that. That was really, really interesting. That was excellent. Well done. Would you like to unshare your screen for us? So I do stop share, Heather. Yeah. Stop share, that's right. Okay. And for those of you that are watching, I'm sorry, I have a co-presenter. <laughs> he, he had a, a chew toy he's bored of it now so he'll fall asleep on my lap so he's my co-presenter okay. <laughs> loads of fun um so that was really super interesting really 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 good stuff i mean um before i spoke to you um i never realized there was a difference between good and bad stress i thought it was just all stress so the research stuff you went through that was like really like people have actually yeah. thought about this stuff it's really interesting but i wanted to ask a question because um on the whole good and bad stress thing Normally, I think um, I think of stress normally in a normal world. I think of stress as quite good because without stress as a journalist, I'm pretty much just like a university student. I don't do any work unless I have a deadline. So I kind of need the deadline, the stress of the deadline and people sort of like breathing down my back to actually do anything. <laughs> so for me, a bit of stress I, I, is good, but I kind of embrace it. I like I used to really like it, you know, because it'd be it'd fire me up and get me going and get things done. But since the whole COVID thing, you know, first pandemic, kind of this year as well, um, I feel like my stress is kind of uncontrolled. I don't see it as good stress because I, and I've, I've realized it's because I can't control it because previously my stress, I could fix it. I could get my work done, hit my deadline and it'll be finished. But now I, I can't control a pandemic. So how, how can I change my mindset and get that kind of side of, how, how can I feel better about this kind of stress that I feel now? You know, what would you advise I, I do or try and do? OK, so first of all, I would kind of you, you, you gave a hint in there um, about control. And I think that that is huge isn't it? When, when you're looking at burn. So what they call burnout or, or some people call. Have you heard of bore out as well? <laughs> it's like a 
bored of it. I've had enough. I want to move on. So, oh. so yeah, that, that's all linked. That's all kind of linked to control, isn't it? And so, so when you're feeling out, be be aware of how you're kind of feeling out of control in your life, and then look at anything, almost like the scaffolding of health. What first of all, I'd start at the basics scaffolding your sleep your your diet your food your exercise kind of set that frame because you know without all that stuff in um, and also that will give you some control in your life you know oh people are working goodness me was it um uh, was it uh, one study i read was um six hour uh, no uh, uh, six hours more a, a, a day uh, um, a week there's all kinds of studies about how so so where you might ordinarily get control say in your journey into work or kind of you go and have a little latte with Sarah if we work together we'd be like oh Heather let's go for a walk let's do this all that kind of la la fun time those little it's almost like um Laurie Santos who's a professor of happiness talks about time confetti time famine and time confetti and it's that idea these kind of little little um, moments of time yeah. so how can you grab some more time some more time confetti back to you to grow your sense of control and that might be doing those little things let's say you've got your scaffolding you've got your food you've got your sleep um, your exercise kind of what it, whatever it is but mm. start to to build in little moments of control time confetti when you say okay i'm going to switch off I'm going to do this, go take that off for a walk. I'm going to do some baking or some bendy stuff, some yoga or some mindfulness, whatever it is. But just kind of kind of really be be aware. So that's one issue is that is the control stuff. And that's so important that we have a sense of agency, which is linked to our self-identity. Um, all kinds of yeah. So look at how you feed um your self-identity stuff like social comparison we all do that we're we're hardwired almost to kind of look and see what others are doing oh i like that i'll have that so it's all about survival learning new habits and behaviors so be aware of kind of how your social comparison is feeding you and feeding your self-esteem if you're looking at all these people doing amazing stuff on the internet on facebook and this, but, or so it, and, and notice how you feel when where where your mindset's going notice how that makes you feel so if that's draining you um again just or just kind of either stop it try try um some time away from it um or really direct the focus of your attention towards something that nourishes and nurtures nurtures you build up back to the um building blocks again social connection is so important so you've seen the impact of oxytocin so kind of, you know, at work, do some connection, collaboration, take that time for your one to ones kind of, you know, yes, do all your big meetings, whatever. But it's really important that you connect with somebody and, and check out. So all that kind of care and stuff that that's one one side. And then going back to what we shove in our subconscious over over the lifetime. Carl Jung said it's like you put it all back and then, then it kind of this tail comes up and curls around you and you have to sort it out. And that's the taking responsibility. And we shove it back and no, 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 it's fine. And then all of a sudden it's just kind of the emotions are coming out. So I think with so kind of looking at your emotions as well. Yeah, mindfulness is great, distraction, focus, whatever. Kind of you can do the mental things, but but emotions are in your body and you can feel sad. Be sad. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of honor that emotion. You can't always distract away from it. Sometimes you have to kind of go and punch a cushion or kind of let it out. So yeah. that's another, and, and I'm not saying, oh, Heather, you need to go to therapy, all that kind of stuff. But just be aware of what you're pushing down into the pot and how you can discharge that energy. Um, it's a rather long answer. Is that okay? Is that oh, that's great. That's perfect. So I put um, on the chat during our set during your session, I put the link to um, your uh, regulation techniques. So, oh, thank you. So those are lots of good exercise in there. I'm actually I'm going to go through them. I'm going to try them out this weekend and just sort of like start making lists and things I need to. Um, we've just got a couple of points in the Q&A section. So first, someone just wants to know who was the name of the person who carried out the research about Good and bad stress, please. Yeah, it's it's called they're called Keller et al. K E W -L, L E R, and I think it was a long time. It was about two thousand six. Mm -hmm. And if you look at uh, Dr. Kelly McGonagall, M C G O N I G A L, she's a health psychologist. She's 
brilliant. So she does all that kind of stuff on stress. Then she does things on movement. Um, she has Dr. Ranjan Chatterjee, Chatterjee's podcast. Mm -hmm. She's one of the speakers on there and she's totally motivational and it's so very interesting. <laughs> and it's lovely kind of having the science to, to back up what we know in, intuitively, isn't it? That connecting with others makes good sense and to know that the oxytocin is coming out. Is to, mm. and actually heals the heart is just amazing. Yeah, it is. It is actually interesting how the you know the, the science is there. It's like a, I think some people might think these kind of well-being type sessions are a bit fluffy, um, but you're just all the way through your session. You're you're quoting loads and loads of solid research with you know stuff that you can't you can't really question it. You know, so it's it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Started off, it wasn't out there, and it's it's almost kind of going back to the wisdom of the contemplative traditions, where the chap was sitting in a cave or, or the lady meditating, and now we're learning things like mindfulness that they really, really, really help. Just reflecting that kind of having insight, having awareness, and it's also that connection between mind, brain, and body, the kind of flow between. Whereas again, in the old days, it was kind of there was a lot of separation um, mm -hmm. to see how our thoughts can shape our minds our body to actually shape our body is is amazing it is yeah. it is and we have uh claudia vaccaroni hi claudia hi nice to see you um who says thank you for, for such a thorough presentation and so actionable i find physical activity and daily sports are a huge help especially now in calming the mind down i can see a big difference in my mindset on days i don't exercise no matter how prepared i am now that's interesting because like for me um I'm bring it back to me it's all about me darling <laughs> good <laughs> before christmas you know when the gyms opened again after lockdown number two i was going every day i went every day went running a few times after the gyms closed when we had our sudden um lockdown at christmas but then i haven't picked it back up again which is partly because of him so he's asleep now not moving just fast asleep but he i have to get up several times during the night to let him out and stuff so my sleep's gone to pot my exercise regime is just gone you know, um, how important is, I mean, Cla Claudia's recognised exercise. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Yes, Claudia, I agree. Yeah, so kind of do anything. And it's really difficult, isn't it? Because our environment that we pick up so many cues from, so you might chain, you know, oh, in my lunch break, I'll go to, to the gym at work or kind of, you know, on the way back from the train, uh, you know, on the train or whatever and everything. So how do we kind of condition a new habit into our environment? And that, and that can be, so So you may have to kind of make it easy for yourself. And there's a guy, if it's, oh gosh, Cleary, somebody Cleary. Oh my good, James Clear. He talks about new habits and how, he talks about the two minute rule. Right. So start off small steps. So you're saying everything's kind of gone to pop because our environment, all our cues are like, bloody hell, what do I do? Who am I? You know, so kind of, so start a new habit, chain it to an existing one, like the one with the um, putting the, the dumbbell by the kettle. So you can start doing that. I've got a wobble board, you know, those little wobble boards just to start. And, and like that, I have this by my desk. I can do my stretchy thing. So so between clients, you can't see me. I'm doing little bits, throw things, la, 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 throw things. Um, the, the table tennis, the ping pong is from my, my younger son. He, he has huge surgery last year and he's a tigger, a bit like you, I suspect, Heather. And so he invented that. He literally got a bat and ball and he was pinging against the walls and by the end of it, and if you've got rough walls and the ping pong ball flies off, I kind of say it gets very sporty. Yeah, it's about being creative, isn't it? In this time when we want to shut down because we're under so much pressure. Mm -hmm. So start start kind of chaining in new new habits, but but be kind throughout this because we're under so much stress. Um, yeah. Set up set up you can that social connection, the oxytocin. Set up little buddy schemes. You know, oh let's do some exercise together, makes you feel happier. They say you know all the stuff from positive psychology is like your act of kindness. They say that one little act of kindness has a hundred ripples, it affects a hundred people. Gratitude, savoring. There's lots of stuff out there that can increase your happiness, but it's almost like a call for us to redefine who we are in, in these times and, and totally get the, the challenge of new habits. And if it is tough, then, then, you know, kind of be compassionate. Yeah, I feel terrible today. I'm not going to do anything. Hit the chocolate. <laughs> chocolate is good. <laughs> 
Um, we have another question from the lovely Anna Lockwood from Telstra, who's one of the Women Advisory Board members. Um, she's saying a lot of us have kids or young ones in our lives that we're trying to support at this time. So this is a huge one. All the parents I know are really stressed out. And um, we have a lot of conversation in our team, um, that's a bit of Telstra, about around trying to help parents, guardians and elders with their relationships with the youngers. How do we best help reduce stress or work stress um, in with with stress in our youngsters so obviously related to having to homeschool and you know keep the kids happy while sorry stress it stress for them or stress for the children so, sorry stress I, in our youngsters. I think with with uh, with both of them so on both sides so for the, the right. parents looking after or the guardians looking after young ones but also kids sort of they must be getting stressed as well not being able to even little ones not being able to go to okay. school okay so there's, there are high levels of parental burnout at the minute. And a recent, there was a study in America where they looked, I think it was doctors, and they, they said that, that women doctors, they had more stress than the men because they are increasing, ab absorbing more of the workload at home, which makes, which makes total sense. And more burnout in young people, women with small children, and those with pre-existing mental health conditions. Um, not surprised at all no. so kind of first first step is obviously um being com compassionate all that kind of connecting um i did an exercise that kind of backfired with my children where i, I sat down. It depends on the age obviously um um so so i sat down with each of mine and i said what can i do to support you during lockdown so that by that way you're communicating and back to you with that kind of sense of control hopefully by doing that you're giving them a sense of control what would you like to do what would kind of make you feel okay so one was just kind of leave me alone mum. give me more computer time let me do it. and the other was painting his room so we kind of we <laughs> that was all so we painted we painted we painted his room and then he put paint strip on the floor and i fell in Sprained, sprained my ankle but that's another but at least kind of so but no virtue signaling here so kind of anything you can do to engage them first of all no you know you could do your window of tolerance exercise where you kind of you could kind of work out like the goldilocks window not when they're too hot you know she doesn't want the porridge too hot or too cold so kind of choose the moment when they're not too hot not too cold to work out the horses. What do they need when they're feeling churned up, when they're feeling um, under stress? And again, sorry, my brain, because then the, the children kind of, they're not in their rational brain. And Dan Siegel does a handy model. He, he's actually a brilliant resource for parents. I would suggest you Google Dr. Dan Siegel. He's an American psychiatrist, has lectured the Pope on attachment theory, the Dalai Lama. And he has wonderful um, tools for regulating for regulating stress. So you can kind of build up, what, you know, what what will you need when when you're angry? What will I need when I'm angry? You know, time out, take a breath, um, do all your basic um, scaffolding. Again, with the, the sleep, the food, the exercise, kind of do do that stuff. And remember that. Oh, to soothe my teenagers, I've never cooked as much. Yes brilliant get creative cooking baking we've been we've been even sadly cleaning the dust behind the radiators i got them. they were pouring in in exchange for computer time they were pouring water behind the radiators to get the big lumps of dust out get creative <laughs> but kind of acknowledge that it's that it is difficult for everyone everyone needs time out how do you get control you know how do you get these little time confetti spaces so so i would suggest you work out what it is you need when you're not churned up when you're not kind of kind of um stressed i remember one client when she, uh, with a young baby she used to tell me she'd sing that i love you song it would so she when they were shouting i'm not saying this is a, she said I love you when you're crying. <laughs> I love you when you're screaming. I love you when you're nothing is changing. So kind of it's so humour can help, but it is tough and honour that that it is really really difficult. Mm. I don't know if that that is that is helpful. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've just got him and he's hard enough, but I, you know, he sleeps a lot more than a normal kid. Um, uh, okay, and, and, but sleep is a massive issue, isn't it? If you, they look at studies that say if you have five hours versus eight hours of sleep, you eat 22% more the next day because you're under stress. 
So right. all, that's all the basic stuff that you need in there, that connection, the me time, uh, and, and so do children. And also don't forget that children don't have the kind of same, um, always have the same ability to communicate their feelings in a way that we do. So that's why all that messy play stuff, the fan, the whatever it is, the cooking, the baking, all that kind of stuff really can help them um, get the energy out, the adrenaline, the cortisol. They maybe can't handle it as, uh, or they handle it differently from us. And uh, you're saying about, uh, you know, get, get it out. Um, we've got a question here. What is better, in your opinion, to leave emotions inside or release them outwards? There, there was, uh, they, they looked at, um, uh, there was a study of, uh, I think it was doctors, I can't, medical staff in Israel, was it? And they, they said, how do you cope with working in, with the, in the COVID wards and everything? And some of them said that they, they um, focused on the task and that was easier to get through, um, through the day. Um, whereas others kind of felt the emotion um, so it's different ways of going, but I think as long as you, um, you have to find your best way, of, you know what regulates you, there is no one way for, for everyone. So if your way is to kind of focus on the task and that works, that's brilliant, do it. If you need to express your emotions, do it. Um, but do remember that when we get churned up, your adrenaline, your cortisol come up. So the message goes from the brain down the vagus nerve to the adrenal glands and they pump up adrenaline and cortisol. Our muscles go hard, ready for fight flight um, to sort the problem out. So, but however, if we need to access our rational brain whilst we're in fight, we're pushing and suppressing these feelings of fear, of anxiety, we're pushing them down. So it may well have a toll if you keep shoving it back, shoving it back. So, so kind of in answer, there's a yes and a no, and it's kind of following you know you and also if your system's um sending messages saying you're too overwhelmed now there's too much in the pot mm -hmm. uh, you might want to go and have a good cry and kind of kind of release it i don't think there's any right or wrong it's just just what works for you um, yeah cool and uh i think we've got last question here unless someone else pings a good, sneaky one at the end um overthinking has been a big thing over the pandemic how do we deal with this oh right have a look have a look if you get um here we go if heather sends you this and this is basically a whole load of techniques throughout my career clients have told me and i'm like oh can i have that one please so one client said when i get anxious and this is an overthinking one she said i write my thoughts down on new roll and then flush them away so kind of that isn't that wonderful so beautiful <laughs> so you kind of got lots of distraction techniques so that's one way so you've got all this kind of this part of your brain is almost looping it's kind of sending these thoughts, overthinking. So, so you can do distraction. You can think of something else. So some people have an elastic band. And every time you're aware, this is having your in, uh, kind of being aware, isn't it? The thought comes in, ping your elastic band um, and then so that you can change your mindset. The thoughts will always be going, la, la, potentially. And just think of it as a part of you, a set of thoughts, a behavior that's just kind of wants attention, wants to grab the driving. Wheel. There you are, it's going in the snow. Just kind of, kind of, if you can turn your attention towards the snow, put on some music, distract. You could do focus, you could do your kind of mindfulness where you do a three minute exercise. And it maybe kind of accept that that part of you could carry on, but let that part carry on doing it but whether you have to focus as much so I'd say for kind of your thoughts stopping do some distraction kind of address it directly and again do you do your so if you did your <laughs> sorry if you if you did your window of tolerance do some strategies that you could do to distract or I phone a friend or you you speak to yourself you tell that part it's just oh, be quiet now I need to get on bless you I'll, or you could set aside five minutes of worry time <laughs> five minutes of worry time okay right I'm going to give you my full attention for five minutes now and you can give me all the worries you want thank you very much so you're starting to kind of boundary it and just kind of kind of um, contain it a, a little bit alternatively you can write your negative thoughts down the, the thoughts down and challenge them and say what's the evidence for this like a law court evidence for evidence against 
how true is this? Uh, so lots of different ways. And there's, there's, there's some great techniques there for distraction, focus, engaging, challenging. Um, yeah. But just, we, again, don't see it as just the fact your thoughts are coming in. See it as part of the bigger picture. Is, is it kind of telling me, telling my system that I'm stressed, that I need to kind of just, that I've got to bore out. I need to do something else. I need to start new hobbies, be, be creative as part of me bored. Why is this part taking over now? Um, yeah. Or, or kind of kind of giving its messages now. Yeah. Right, well, we'll leave it there then. Thank you so much for that, Sarah. That was really, really enlightening. It was brilliant. Um, really, really good. Um, I think even though there's light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, thanks to vaccines, there's still a long way to go. And that's made this session today even more important, especially in these kind of winter months where, you know, we're looking, you can see some daffodils starting to starting to try and come out of the soil, but the, the flowers aren't there yet. So we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, if you do want to get another copy of Sarah's um, PDF, on um, regulation, regulation techniques and tools, please pop me an email and I'll send it over to you. Okay, so stay in touch, look out for news on our next uh, event that's coming up in April. And thank you again to Sarah, and I'll see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye.